Good evening and welcome to the Museum of Science. Thank you all so much for being here tonight and joining us for this special screening of Endless Abilities. Um, tonight's uh, program is a co-presentation with our friends at the Real Abilities Film Festival. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to introduce the festival director, Nisi Clark, who's here to tell us a little bit more about um, Real Abilities and their current offerings. Good evening and welcome to the fifth annual Real Abilities uh, Boston F Film Festival. My name is Nisi Clark and I'm actually the uh, festival producer. Uh, and I am very proud to be a part of uh, Real Abilities Boston. Thank you for joining us for this special event. Uh, the Real Abilities Film Festival is dedicated to promoting awareness and appreciation of the lives, the stories, and the artistic expressions of the people with disabilities from a variety of communities. We would like the thank the following generous sponsors who have made this festival possible. We have AXA, I know she's here somewhere, um, Butler Foundation, the Kaplan Family Foundation, the Mass Cultural Council, Nancy Lurie Marks Family Foundation, Peapod, Ruderman Family Foundation, Special Needs Financial Planning, <clears throat> Special Olympics of Massachusetts. Thanks also to the Boston Jewish Film Festival, which hosts Real Abilities in Boston. Our closing night is tomorrow night. Uh, we're at Somerville Theater, and we're, hosting, we're screening a film called How to Dance in Ohio. Um, and afterwards, uh, if you come to the screening, you can join us uh, at a special reception following at Orleans Restaurant. Uh, please take a moment to fill out our survey online at boston.realabilities.org. Um, the survey has been very important to us, and we use it to program and fundraise for next year's festival. So if you're looking for a great, great way to help us keep the festival going, that's a great way to do it. When you take um, the survey, uh, your name will be entered into a drawing to win a $200 Amazon gift card. We also want to recognize our incredible host partners this evening, the Museum of Science in Boston. They have been excellent. Thank you, Nisi, and thank you to the entire Real Abilities Film Festival team. The documentary we are so pleased to be presenting for you all tonight tells a story of uh, four best friends and their incredible journey across country in search of individuals participating in adaptive sports. You will witness incredible examples of athleticism, courage, and the ability of the human body to adapt and thrive. One of my favorite stories from the film um, comes from a woman named Kendra who, prior to her accident, never considered herself a sports fan and had actually never even seen a sporting event. Yet, when her life was changed, it was a sport that she turned to. And as you will see, power soccer becomes one of the most important things in her life. This resonated with me as a perfect example of the film's core message. Kendra, like everyone else you will see in the movie, did not let her life become defined by physical disability. Instead, her resilience allowed her to grow as an individual and, can, and continue towards um, her fullest potential. The film also traces the development um, of the adaptive sports movement. One of the pioneers of the movement is Eli Wolf, whom we are privileged to have with us here tonight. We will hear a little bit from Eli and then screen the film after his remarks. Now, please join me in welcoming to the stage uh, Eli Wolf. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. This is really an honor. And uh, there's some amazing people in the room that are also, that have even further pioneered the movement as well. So I feel like I'm a part of a larger group that has really been working together to bring to light the opportunities for people with disabilities in sport in a variety of contexts. And I guess for me, I just to kind of set the stage and to share a few words, I just really had sort of five reflections or five things to think about. Maybe we can come to later in the discussion. Um, and, and really reflecting back on the disability community, disability sport, as it's evolved, I would say one of the key things to start to think about is this notion of how do we, with the lens that we have or the way that we actually envision people with disabilities doing sport and engaging sport as athletes first. I think historically we've seen the evolution of a, from a medical or a rehabilitation model of kind of focusing on the disability first and then now it's how do we begin to think about 
the athlete first and in which way and how do we tell those stories, how do we frame those conversations. And so that's sort of one thing to, to really think about. I guess the second point that I wanted to make has to do with how people with disabilities involved in physical activity and sport and athletes at different levels are really a part of the broader disability community. You know, they're engaging, they're involved, they recognize their civil and human rights. And so the disability community and the sports community and how those two have begun to interact more and more together. I think historically there may have been a perception that those that are engaging in sport or being involved, you know, are sort of this kind of super crip perspective of, you know, it's sort of this arena that's not really related to the rest of society, other issues like education or healthcare or just general access in general. And so I guess one thing to think about is, well, perhaps sport and physical activity and being involved in recreation are actually really important to the human condition, to the way that we want to achieve our lives in all the areas. And so how can we be sure that this intersection of our disability community and our sports and recreation world are really working hand in hand? And so I think that's really been a sort of a second thing to think about and as we kind of look through the lens of the film today. The third kind of viewpoint or perspective has to do with really the evolution of media coverage. And I think particularly as we have our great host with Real Abilities and the way we're really starting to see people with disabilities in film in a variety of contexts and on television and in various ways of, of recognizing how people with disabilities are at the table, are involved with, with the media. And I think that what, are we, what we're seeing is really that shift in the way we are seeing people with disabilities moving from the lifestyle sections into the sport sections of the newspapers and the coverage of actually the lens that we have to actually recognize this as, as sport. And I think that part of it is to re how do we recognize people with disabilities as being athletes, but also that there is an important, powerful connection through the media and through sport. Um, but again, it has to not be from a pity perspective. It can't be a charity story. And how do we really tell powerful, um, empowering, inspirational stories that are, that are just sports stories, you know, and I think, or, and recreation stories. So I think that's really important of this conversation of the media. And I think today in our society, we're still seeing some of these kind of pity and charity. And sometimes I call them like the water boy stories where a person with disability is brought up you know, the last play of the game or they kind of walked out and it's, it is something in our culture and our society that I think we have to begin to question. And maybe we can come back to that, you know, a little bit later. So I think this issue of the media and how, how are we telling these stories. And so I think the film really brings that to light. I guess the fourth area that I wanted to address is sort of around systemic change. And I guess the one thing that I would call our attention to is the way that we've seen the systemic change for girls and for women through Title IX and through the opportunities that we see now with you know, equal pay for women in sport and women in society. And I think that that kind of movement within gender rights and, and also you could also parallel it to LGBT rights and other um, rights for other minorities, that people with disabilities too, from a systems change perspective, that people with disabilities can be involved at all levels from the recreational side at the grassroots all the way to being involved in various types of elite competitive sport. And I think that from having that systems change approach, we, one of the areas that I think is really important to look at, which we saw, in, we see a little bit in the story, is that what is that pathway? You know, the pathway that people with disabilities have to be able to participate at young ages and recreational programs, into school programs, into college programs, into YMCA, boys and girls, at all the levels, there has to be the opportunity, um, you know, after school programs and so forth. I, I think that that's really important that people with disabilities and the disability community take that systems change approach similar to the way that women's sports and, and other groups have looked at societal change and then how do we approach that within sport. And I guess just the final point to touch on, you know, because really the most important thing is the film and really excited to kind of say, and now the film. But the final point I wanted to make is, um, is the young people. And I think this is a really central part of the movement and of the voices that we're starting to hear 
and making sure that we are really capturing the voices of, of young people. And what we're seeing, I think, in the broader disability rights community is we're seeing this ADA generation, you know, those that have had the, the opportunity to have some of the benefits of the rights approach and the realization of the access and some of the things that are provided to young people where there wasn't necessarily dragging yourself up the steps of the White House or things like that, but it's a different type of inclusion. It's a different type of empowerment. And there's that voice, the young voice of, of what does inclusion mean to young people today and how is that really changing? And so I think that's really important too, to kind of see, well, you know, from a mentorship standpoint, from a legacy standpoint, from kind of where are we gonna be in 20 years from now, that really it is, you know, the young people, um, you know, kind of say, well, you know, where are we headed? What, what do we need to do to take action? And I think one of the things that young people, you can even see it at very young ages, you know, they're not as afraid to say it to you straight, you know, this is what inclusion is, or this is, you know, why aren't you including my friend? You know, I think it's pretty, pretty powerful when you hear from young people what inclusion really means. So I think just to, you know, now to say, let's start the film, but again, really thank you all so much. It's a great opportunity, and thank you to the team from Endless Abilities and, and all of you here. I'm really looking forward to an engaging conversation today. So thank you so much and to the film. Basically, my father passed away when I was 15. My best friend still with me in spirit. He taught me how to surf when I was six years old. That's when I realized that I needed to catch my own wave. I needed to have some sort of independence and be able to do that on my own. The summer of 2012 will forever be remembered as the best summer of our lives. We put out an open call to anybody with any disability. It didn't matter where you were from or what sport you were into. So we've planned this trip to connect with like-minded people that's really helping people understand that there are endless abilities. In the beginning, I really didn't know where my life would go. I kind of realized that I was probably going to be in a chair for the rest of my life. Like, it hasn't been all, like, sunshine and roses for you. <laughs> and... There was no other reality except that I was helpless. I would get out of the shower and I would cry my eyes out. It was guys coming to my bedside and saying, hey, when you're ready, you will be able to golf and you will be able to ski and you will be able to cycle and rock climb and water ski and scuba dive and sail. For the first time ever, I saw people in racing wheelchairs, much like this one here, go whizzing by. And that was the first time that I realized that people with disabilities could go to college, could have families, could have dreams and jobs and goals. I just found out I really liked doing sports and being active. So it wasn't really about being athletic, it was about being independent and just doing stuff for myself. Through sports, through activities, you'll see that we're much more alike and we are different. Over and over and over again, disabled athletes are proving that they're able to achieve things that no one would have dreamed that were possible. I read about Jesse Blower in a magazine. You know, this guy's paralyzed from here down. That to me is pretty impressive and I said that if that guy can do it with that disability, there's no reason why I can't be surfing with my disability. Now that we're doing this project, our goal is to get out there and to let him know that he's the reason why I, I am who I am. Jesse, what's up man? So we're gonna surf Malibu on the 20th? Dude, I'm really looking forward to it, dude. I, you've been on my radar ever since I first got hurt, so it'll be cool. No doubt. Bye. That's totally awesome. It's totally awesome, dude. We just ran out of gas. A little breakfast in the desert. We just blew out a tire in the highway. No biggie. We're a little bit far away from home right now. These are my three best friends. This is the bus we lived in for 40 days. And this is the story of the people we met on the most incredible journey of our lives.
What an incredible film, and we're so lucky to have the team behind it with us here tonight. Uh, so if you could please all join me in welcoming producer Will Humphrey, co-directors Trip Clemens and Harvey Burrell. Guys, please stand and say hello. <laughs> and in a last minute twist that these guys don't even know, uh, we have, can we bring him in, the fourth member of the team, Zach Bastian is here, so come on in. Welcome, Zach. And we'll bring up the full team in just a couple of minutes, but right now I'd like to invite Eli back to the stage uh, for a conversation with Will Humphrey, the producer of Endless Abilities. Zach. So Zach was originally not supposed to be here because um, he is studying um, OT right now and, and is obsessed with the 4.0 GPA and training for the Boston Marathon. So. Awesome to have you here. Yeah, no big, big date coming up. So good luck in the marathon. Yeah. yeah but, the, uh, no, you first. You first. I was going to ask you about just your journey a little bit, kind of getting into the film, and kind of how did you guys end up connecting and just sort of bringing it to bear. So maybe yeah, a little of your background and some of that. I mean, yeah, just, no. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the film accurately portrays what happened. I mean, Zach approached us and said, I really want to be able to um, give back to Spalding in a way, and that was to um, show them a video of somebody just experiencing life. Um, for that, um, for Zach, it was just the ability to go out and surf and to experience that. Um, it was maybe a step above transferring out of his wheelchair, um, getting in and out of a bathroom stall, um, or in and out of bed. Um, but it wasn't really an inspiration story. It was just, mm -hmm. he was trying to be a normal guy. Um, and that kind of morphed into a 20 minute film and then it kind of morphed into a film that wasn't necessarily about us, um, but was about the people who we met. Um, for me, you know, I've, yeah, I, I've, I've always been um, involved with adaptive sports. Um, I skied competitively in high school and my coach was, um, was a person who was paralyzed from the waist down, and he could always ski better than me, faster than me, um, and I always thought that was really interesting. But um, Zach kind of opened our eyes up to the fact that you don't necessarily need to um, be involved in adaptive sports just for competition. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was one of the major takeaways for us for the film was that um, oftentimes people say, you know, oh, you're gonna go and play wheelchair basketball, or you're gonna go and, and ski in the Paralympics. Um, and when you're sitting in a hospital bed and you see somebody doing a backflip on a mono ski, mm. that's incredible. Um, but totally. that kind of <laughs> lengthens the gap for you between where you are right now um, and where the perceived um, you know, quality of life goal should be. So yeah, you seem like that kind of recreational piece, kind of that kind of a pathway piece was sort of a a theme throughout the journey too. And so as you guys were filming and developing, like were you guys talking about the themes and the chapters? Was like that yeah. was that sort of a part of it as you were going or did it kind of emerge afterwards? Or? To be honest, I think that it probably emerged um, afterwards. You know, when um, Trip, Harvey and Zach come up, I think that we can talk more yeah, about yeah. just the structure of the film because it is important to note that, you know, there are different stages of the film. There are different kind of milestones that we realized. Um, mm -hmm. First was that competition wasn't um, everything. Um, second was that somebody has to be ready to see the film. Somebody has to be ready to accept, um, like the rock climber who was speaking, somebody had to be accept or be able to accept um, that they want to move on or that they were ready to um, go and be active in the community um, mm -hmm. once they knew it was out there. So. Was it hard to manage uh, Zach's rock star ego? The whole time? <laughs> no. Was that like a big issue going through? Always humble, you know, it was really hard to find sports <laughs> that he couldn't do. I think we lucked out with, uh, with, with sled hockey as he was wearing Sperry's. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but no, everything that, that you know, we That's tried, awesome. we, we, you know, we all tried. Um, you know, blind rock climbing, we put on 
you know, big blindfolds, and that really laid out, leveled out the playing field, you know, for sled hockey for Zach. Um, he was on the same playing field um, as someone with spina bifida. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really interesting, that was really cool for us, to be able to experience the same sport um, on the same level playing field. Yeah, that's awesome. That was awesome, and you know, as, obviously you have a sport background. Yeah. Um, how did you first get into sport, and, and did you feel like the the playing fields were level when you were in sport? I mean, that was a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, for me, it was just interesting watching the film because you kind of see the emergence of the field. And I know one of the things with adaptive sports over the years is that sometimes it's sort of a random occurrence. You know, I was here at high school at Milton Academy, and I was down down at Mass Hospital School, which is a rehab hospital in uh, Canton, Mass. And I was actually doing more of like working within the community. And I, there was a mentor there of mine, Sebastian G. Francesco, who spotted me playing, you know, competitive soccer and being involved. And then this whole world opened up of adaptive sports. And you know, sometimes it's funny because now, you know, with other colleagues here, like Joe Walsh, I think, is here, and then Shanine, and some of the other folks that are very involved, many others here, I'm sure, as well. In the adaptive sports world, we sometimes we talk about sort of like. How do you recruit people into the yeah. space? You know, you like see them walking down the street, and you like bring your flyer. <laughs> you know, like how do you actually f you know find people? Yeah. And um, now for me, mine was sort of this trajectory of getting involved, and then I sort of entered kind of more of the advocacy and education arena to see it. And uh, but no, I think your guys' journey was just really amazing to see it, like see how it's really happening on the ground. You know, to see kind of where these programs are and who, you know, it seems one of the big things with adaptive sports, it seems like a strong, strong community leaders, you know, that are actually activating these programs. You saw the directors of the different programs and they all have these kind of like passion and really like a strong, a strong sense of like, this is important that we develop these opportunities. And so, I don't know, is that, is yeah, that no, something I mean, that you felt too? Like there's sort of like these strong people that are really trying to push this movement forward? Yeah, no, there are strong people and, and you know, when we were, being, when, when we were beginning to film, it almost wasn't this natural push, right? It was, it was always this uphill push. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when the Paralympics were, were first screened on, on live national television, that was a big stepping stone because then it was like, okay, now the public has access to learn about it, to be aware about yeah. it. Because I'm not sure you know, what your experiences are, but um, you've been in the community within the Paralympics for a long time. and not everybody knows even what the Paralympics are. You know, are they, does Paralympics stand for the Olympics for paralyzed people? Mm -hmm. I thought that, to be honest with you, for a long time. Um, right. But instead it's just that the, the Olympics run parallel to the Paralympics. The Paralympics are always a few weeks after the Olympics. Yeah, and they're all connected and part of it. And there's it's been an evolution, you know, of the development of the Olympic and Paralympic movement. And then, and also I think one of the great things is that there's sort of been this evolution of realizing that you know, there's Special Olympics, there's Deaf Olympics, there's it's sort of the cross-disability notion of people with disabilities in sport in these different arenas. And um, so I think that's, that's something that I've seen, particularly over the last few years, is that, you know, there is a stronger sense of, like, the notion that there's these different types of opportunities, some competitive, some recreational, serving different types of populations. Um, but then how are we kind of, you know, connecting together, you know, offering different types of opportunities so that people can reach their potential. Because not everybody wants to be an elite athlete. You know, some people just want to go out for that bike ride and so forth. So, you know, I think that's, that's an important part of it for sure is to be able to provide that education of like, you know, what is the Paralympics or what is, you know, this program serving those with autism or, you know, different types of opportunities. And I think that's where we're, it's, this field, I feel like is still in an emerging stage because we still have a lot of work to do, a lot of partnerships to build, a lot of ways to connect. But, um, but no, I think that the way that you guys have been able to tell the story, you know, and be able to show it, I think it really kind of like starts the conversation. And so I, mean, I think that's why I'm excited. I know we wanted to kind of turn it over to yeah. some Q&A. Do you think we should yeah, maybe do absolutely. that now? Yeah, really bring up from the audience. Bring up some folks. So. Great. Thank you both for that yeah. as well. Um, we're going to bring up the rest of the team now. So Trip, Harvey, and Zach, if you'd come up. If you guys have any questions while they get settled, just feel free to put your hand up, and we will bring a microphone over to you.
questions well, from the audience? Yeah. Why, we'll have a discussion why don't you with start the by just giving us an update on you, Zach? What you're up to? How's it been? You know, everybody wants to know. Hi. Um, yeah. Should take the gum out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the most like politically correct, like formal person Which that you might meet. <laughs> so I got here by the seat of my pants. Uh, I was supposed to be in class tonight and I woke up, it was a beautiful day, and I kind of flirted with the idea of coming up here and ditching class. So I was able to um, be a bad influence on a couple of my classmates and talk them into coming up with me. And here we are. So I was knocking on the door. I'm glad that I didn't, um, <laughs> nobody heard that. Now that I see the situation, <laughs> If you guys had opened the door, that would have been hilarious, but um, no, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm studying for occupational, uh, to be an occupational therapy assistant right now. Uh, it's a two-year program that's pretty intense, and honestly, I, I can't commit to things like this anymore. I, I want to be at every screening, but obviously, I have to say no, and then, I, and then today, I was able to get up here, so mm. I decided to be here. Um, so again, yeah, I'm... I'm I'm studying to be an occupational therapist, and I'm training for the marathon, the Boston Marathon, I'll do on Monday. So you guys might have noticed that <laughs> I was showing a friend uh, yesterday, uh, one of the teachers from my school, this, this film, and she said, so how are you involved in it? I was like, what do you mean? I'm just I'm in it. She's like, oh, that's you. She didn't even realize it because I grew a little bit of, of facial hair and um, I don't jiggle as much anymore. So Tripp and I were talking yesterday. We said that we're going to go reshoot that shot of me, um, Will and I going down the, um, the waterfall and we're going to do it with less jiggle and more facial hair. So we're going to do that this summer. That's bad for both of us, I think. <laughs> You both can reshoot. <laughs> yeah, you both can reshoot it, please. So Any that's questions? my story. Any questions? Oh. Comments, questions. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry. What number will you be in the marathon? Uh, do I look like the kind of guy that's got his number already? <laughs> Come on. I'll, <laughs> I'll have my number. I will have my number um, on Sunday afternoon. The, the very last minute, probably. We'll and the, the Endless Abilities Facebook or something yeah, like that. Um, we'll tweet it. Also, um, you could download the Boston Marathon app if you have a smartphone and look up any runner's mm. name. Mm. And you can actually track where they are on the marathon route. So you guys you really don't need to watch me. Wait a couple of years. <laughs> I'm going to be like, you He's know. Gonna be first. That was your, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that was a big answer. He's going to be first. <laughs> so um, we actually brought a box of t-shirts, but we left it in our car. So. We're gonna we're gonna hand out shirts to anybody who's gonna show up at the marathon on Monday because we want to just canvas Boylston Street with Endless Abilities T-shirts. Okay, so stick around after the screening. We'll just run to the parking lot and bring back some shirts. You have to come now, and and wear the shirt obviously. And wear the shirt. <laughs> Any more questions? Front and center. We're gonna pass a mic a to couple. you. Yeah. Comment, a wonderful film. I think you covered Thank you. the gamut. Um, I was not aware of the political part at all, and you know I think that's true of most of us. Um, so thank you for making us aware of, of that piece. Mm. Um, where, where are you going to college? Um, so I've never really been into academics and I was, you know, I, I, we were, I was just having this conversation outside. Um, we, we got back from the road trip and I, you know, I went to school for Spanish. I, I became proficient in Spanish and I, I didn't really see much direction with that, uh, education wise. Uh, I was dealing poker and then we started this project and I finally had a sense of fulfillment and. I said to myself, you know, I need to be able to do this, I do this type of work, you know, affect people for the rest of my life. Um, and I didn't really know how to do that. I was 25 years old, there was kind of a, like a dark, ominous period in the regards to the fact that I didn't really know where I wanted to go. But um, a friend of mine had just graduated the Community College of Rhode Island uh, Occupational Therapy Assistant Program, and he told me all about it. He had a job lined up before he even graduated and was telling me all kinds of great things. So I kind of looked into it. It was five minutes from my home and it ended up being a great opportunity for me. Um, I just kind of jammed with getting my classes on, got into it, and will be a therapist next spring. Mm. Yeah. Is there a 
website where we could, yeah. you know, we could obtain all the information. Yeah. Obtaining information. I mean, um, EndlessAbilities.org has a bunch of links um, and partners. We've partnered with a lot of really great organizations, Disabled Sports USA um, being probably the most accessible um, organization to just connect people. Um, There's a good community of network of adaptive sports. That's Access Rec Boston, Shanine. And then there's also a, a Paralympic organization, Special Olympics. Um, but they're all kind of connected to that. Um, so I would say maybe the Adaptive Sports Rec is sort of a gateway. Access in, Recreation Boston. Yeah. Access Rec.org. Um, hi, I'm Shanine. Um, so we started Access Recreation Boston as a place to have one platform for people with disabilities, across disabilities, across recreation, sport, competitive, recreational, in one place for Greater Boston, loosely defined yeah. as eh, 495, but really we've got members in Maine and New Hampshire as well. So um, accessrec.org, and if you're interested in Finding out more, adding what to what we have on the site. Let me know. Yeah, thank you. Hope you'll be around after this. Yeah, yeah. and if anybody has any other leave. questions, you can go to endlessabilities.org, and there's a way to email us there. Okay, we a have lot a lot of great groups here today too, so I'm sure people will stick around. We have a question right here. Oh, my question was answered. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I think we got one in the back. We got some we in the back. We have a question up in the back. Hi, um, great film. I thought it was really Thanks. incredibly yeah. inspiring. But um, you guys didn't start out as filmmakers, did you? In life? Yeah, I, no, exactly. So, I mean, I'm, I'm curious as to sort of your process. So, you know, it was beautifully shot. It was really beautifully edited. I think you told a great story. And as not sort of going into it as filmmakers, I'm curious about how you, did you? I don't know. We, I no, mean, we I did. Study. We were, I mean, truth be told, we were all still, with the exception of Zach at the time, in our undergrad. Um, so I'd taken a year off. So I was a, we shot, I was a, between our sophomore and junior years of college, yeah, your, junior your junior and senior year. Yeah. 20 years. Uh, where we kind of timed, we'd raise the funds, and then literally we all finished exams got back to Rhode Island, um, built out the rest of the bus and hit the road. So we'd kind of timed it around that. But Tripp was at, at Emerson studying film. I was at Vanderbilt studying kind of a mix of things tangential to film. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that was kind of our, our life goal was to be documentary filmmakers even even before this. Wow, okay, excellent. So what, so, um, do, what did you, what did you think you were gonna, what did you, what did you think you were, was gonna happen when you did this film? Like, film. How, did, how did it transform you? Yeah, can I take that one? Go for it. So I, I really had an assumption going into this that we were gonna make a film about how um, if you become disabled, if you experience an injury, for example, and you lose some uh, ability physically, that your life wouldn't be awful, that you could have some good quality of life and the transformation that happened to me was that I discovered that for a lot of people actually life can be better than it was before that because you have some sort of incredibly transformative mm. experience that transcends the body that you were in before and therefore also the mind and really brings you to a whole new place spiritually. And so we saw that happen with the girl who was playing uh, power soccer we saw that with the cross-country skier. And I remember holding the camera and thinking, what? <laughs> That's incredible. Um, and I, I said this to Zach, and I remember, I know he remembers it. Uh, at the end of the trip, I was like, you know, I could honestly wake up in a hospital bed and know that it will be OK. And it's a crazy feeling, um, because that is such a scary place. But I, we have now heard enough of those stories to have that confidence. I think that for the distribution side, I think that we made the film with just the intention of just impacting one life. If we could change somebody's life, just one, then I think that all of our, our efforts would be worth it. Um, so we had this goal to be in, in as many rehab hospitals as possible. You know, we're, we're in Spalding, um, we're, we're you know, in Craig, and a few others. So we're just making the film accessible to people who need to see it the most, who are ready to see it. Um, you know, it was, it was a great honor um, to be played on television through PBS. 
um, in theaters through Gather, having DVDs and Blu-rays and T-shirts. I mean, this is all fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's great to be able to know that there's an actual demand for um, people to actually see a film and to, and to take something away from that. We have a question here. So, hola, Zach. No te voy a preguntar nada en español. I won't ask you anything in, in Spanish. <laughs> Good luck, Zach. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm getting nervous. I'll let you off the hook. Um, I have a question and a comment. And the question is, do any of you still keep in touch with the folks in the movie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every month. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I mean, um, Emily actually now works. Emily's a girl from the hospital who got into rowing and started building a bike. Um, she now works for uh, Ford Motor Company in um, in Detroit. She's a part of their engineering team, like top level engineering team. Um, John, who was the skateboarder from Pittsburgh, that was really like his first few months when we went to film skateboarding, and now he's. Hmm world traveling, like his job is to be a professionally sponsored touring wheelchair skateboarder. Um, so that he's just gone through an incredible transformation. Um, Kristen's in DC. Kristen Duquette, White House. Kristen Duquette is now working at the White House. She's the girl who called us uh, and said, you know, guys, you, know, you, you might want to reconsider my scene in the film because I didn't get into the 2012 Paralympics. My life is over. Yeah, yeah. and no, we were like, Kristen, actually. you're going places. You're staying in the film. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be okay. And so she's at the White House. Big surprise. Um, and uh, we, I think w what's also really important is not just the people who are in the film that are reaching back out to us, but those who we have never met before who reach out to us. Um, and it often happens on Facebook because it's just the most accessible universal network where we get really random <laughs> messages that usually spike after our film screens on PBS. We've had two national PBS screenings over the last year and we will get messages from people who are like, I was just surfing, I had to stop and I saw this film and I was hooked. And for us that's really flattering, sometimes the messages go one step further to say, I have a disability, this film came, I'm gonna paraphrase, at a really important part of my life because I'm in a really dark place, I've really lost myself, but now I'm re-inspired. And then we get into a dialogue where we connect them with a local sporting chapter, usually with Disabled Sports USA. So that's, that's one way where we're able to, to really realize, okay, like Will said, if this even sees one person, as long as it's the right person, then we're, we've done our job. Well, my comment is that I don't know who else is inspired, but this is one person that you inspired because I had been thinking for a few years, I really want to go sailing and learn how to sail. And I found a place that does the adaptive sailing. And I've been like, no, nah, no, nah, you know, I can't do it. Maybe I'm too old, maybe there's excuses, but actually, I'm going home and I'm gonna put my name in there. I'm gonna sail this summer, thank you. <laughs> Are you going to go to Pierce Park? Pierce. Are you going to... Uh, Where are you going sailing? Are you going to go to Pierce Park? Pierce Park, yeah. Let's go sailing. We, we work like we two houses. Houses. So like the, yeah. houses. The, the yeah. head Pierce of the board Park. at Pierce Park, his name is Jim Donahue. He's a, he's a Vietnam vet and he's got one leg. He's the coolest guy in the world. Let us, we'll put you in touch. <laughs> really awesome. fun He teaches program. sailing. He's Thank like, you so much. Yeah. We'll go sailing together. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was actually paralyzed 11 months ago um, and was an inpatient at Spalding for a month. And so it was very eerie kind of to see Emily's footage because I was like, oh, that's the new Spalding. Oh, that's the old Spalding. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of tried to. <laughs> <laughs> I think probably nobody else noticed, but since I spent a month there and still do outpatient PT, I noticed. Um, and they, from the get-go, noticed that like I was an athlete beforehand and that sports are really important. They have a huge therapeutic recreation department. Um, and I know you guys said you like have partnered with some hospitals, but have you actually thought about talking to Spalding and these other hospitals about showing it to inpatients? We, because yeah. that I would have yeah. loved to have seen when I was sitting in bed when, and like, I can't move anything. When were you at Spalding? 11 months ago, you said? Uh, June 5th to July 2nd. Okay, so that probably would have been like right number like, one. Yeah, so it's actually like both, Will can probably explain better. Yeah, so the biggest thing for us um, that you may be able to relate to is that we don't want to force the film on anyone. We don't want to 
be able to like have a big screening at a hospital and, and make it like a mandatory event for you know, a floor. So what we did was create a program where we are on the on-demand network at the hospitals um, around the country so that when somebody is ready, when somebody is ready to see that there is another life um, outside of, of you know, their current situation, it's just adapted, um, and they accept their current condition, they are able to see the film. Um, and so we think it's probably the best way that, that, that you know, we can be a resource. Um, but yeah, we went into Spalding in September, I believe it was. Yeah, Mary Pat Stone's been yeah. very supportive. And my partner is uh, Sherry Blowett, who's a doctor at, uh, at Spalding. Mm -hmm. And so we've been able to kind of carry the message through the rehab exactly. hospital world. I would, my advice to you is to reach out to the people you know and tell them that it did impact, you know, you after seeing it. Yeah. Um, I know that, you know, when we started this film, I wanted to see it do two things. I wanted to see it kind of give people general knowledge of what people with disabilities can do and change their perspective of somebody with a disability. And I wanted it to inspire somebody that had the disability in a hospital bed that you know wasn't quite sure what their life would be like. I, I often explain to people that the, the biggest challenge for me after my accident was not anything physical with myself. I knew that I was going to be OK um, you know, because I had that attitude. But it was, how do other people see me now? And I, I struggled with that for years. you know, and, and I don't anymore. And I think seeing a film like this back in, when I was in rehab makes having that disability look cool. It doesn't make it, doesn't make it look different, you know, different. And, you know, ostracized, you know, I, 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 th I thought that that's what I wanted to see the film do, and I think that's what I saw, that, mm -hmm. that's what it did. Um, therapists, a lot of times, you know, they have a lot of stuff going on there. I mean, if you go into a patient's room, you see their schedule, and there's, there's no free time for the patient. Now, think about what the therapist is doing throughout that, the course of their day. They're not really, a lot of them, you know, are thinking about their therapy, and they're not thinking about what recreational, um, therapy is doing and, and who's talking about a film like this, but it's, it's a huge impact. You know, studying thera uh, occupational therapy, uh, you look at treatment a little bit differently than what this film aims to do, but it doesn't mean that it's not a huge inspiration for somebody. It's going to get them out of bed and doing their therapy and participating in their therapy, and it's really going to maximize, you know, your PT, your OT, your speech therapy as well. So tell the people you know, say, hey, this, mm. this totally changed my attitude and how I look at my situation and that's how we're going to see it um, you know being pushed on patients more a couple more we have the next question right here hello amazing film thank you so much for sharing that story thank you. Um, so I'm a PT student along with a lot of people in this row and <laughs> I'm now like trying to brainstorm how I can create a way to show the film while still doing therapeutic exercise with our patients tomorrow because it's <laughs> it was such a powerful, powerful story. Um, question: So you tried lots of adaptive sports during the film. Have you kept up with any of the ones you tried, and or have you discovered any new ones that have really piqued your interest? So that's that's to me. <laughs> um, Oh, geez. That question usually goes a little bit different, and, it, and people ask me what my favorite um, sport was, which I really like to answer. I, uh, obviously, I, <laughs> So he's gonna. No. no. Um, so no, I, I honestly. Reframe. Adaptive sports are so expensive, and people are always asking me, like, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? They're all awesome, but you know, you kind of have to pick and choose what you want to do. I mean, it's, I, I don't even own my own race chair. It was donated to me from Spalding and I've spent over a thousand dollars this winter on, you know, accessories for that chair to get myself to, to the race on Monday. So it's very, very expensive. Um, you really can't do anything. I mean, the cheapest sport that I can do is paddle boarding. You know, it's cost like 800 bucks for a paddle board, but, um, no, so I, I don't think I have. You've been mono skiing still. You've been mono skiing. That's dude, you learned how to ski. Oh, that's huge. Yes. What did you do All right, well, the film? We didn't we didn't get a lot. Um, one of the first things we wanted to do with the film is is take a, a trip up to New Hampshire and expose the sport of mono skiing or, or adaptive skiing. Um, for years, I tried I tried to do that, and you know I have kind of flighty friends like, oh, we'll go up tomorrow. I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that, man. Like, I need to learn with a program with their equipment and their instructors and. We need a little bit of um, 
you know, planning. <laughs> These guys are good at planning. So they weren't like my, my bum friends from, from high school that wanted to go up on, you know, the next day. So we got into mono skiing and that had like changed my life. It's, it's you know, before, before that, um, I like lived and eat and breathed summer, you know, all winter long, that's all I would think about is when is summer gonna come? You know, I surfed, uh, paddle boarding, I had a four wheeler, I like to do fun outdoor summer activities and I hate like the end of August, I'd start to get depressed because I knew that I was gonna have to deal with a whole winter of not doing these things. And <laughs> now like, Winter is like my new summer. I absolutely love it. I take trips all, all the time up to up north and go skiing. So it really changed my life. I don't get depressed anymore in the fall. Um, so yeah, skiing had absolutely changed my life. As far as other things that we did on the road, um, it was that, that cross country skiing, like the, uh, on the skateboard. That was like amazing. And I'd have to say if, if anything that I found on the road um, you know, that really sparked my interest. I didn't think I was gonna like that. It's like kind of a, a monotonous cardio workout. It wasn't very, you know, fast paced and exciting. But I realized that I really liked that cardio workout and I would love to, to have a, a situation like that around here where I could do that. Hmm. Um, and I don't, but I got hooked up with some people that got me into the race chair and that's kind of how I, I get that cardio experience now. We have one more question, and then this we'll have one more after this. Hi, um, that was a really inspiring film. Um, I'm also a student um, in the field of rehab science, and so are my colleagues here. So um, you all have such a unique perspective on disability after this experience, and I'm just wondering if you had any advice to some future healthcare professionals um, in the field of rehab. That's a good question. Like down the line? Like <laughs> Can we Sorry, go left, right? right? <laughs> um, I, I, can, I can say something. Um, so, you know, as an OT student, we learn a lot about rapport. And um, this is, I don't mean to like single any, anybody out that, that knows me in here. Nobody does this, but these guys do because they spent so much time with me in close quarters in a bus. And when there's a curb cut over here and the most direct line to where you're going is here, they'll never, ever, ever go that way. They'll always go with me. Um, so little things like that make a, make a big difference. You know, like I don't want to feel like I'm alone in, in what I'm doing. And I think that's really big with, with building rapport. People don't think about it and they think about like, sometimes people think, well, hey, I can do this. You know, this, can't, this guy can't, so maybe I should do it just because I can. But it's not about that, you know? Somebody's not gonna get offended with you if there's a ramp here and stairs here and you chose to go down the ramp with your patient. I mean, these are kind of basic things that I think you guys m might already know, but a lot of people don't, and um, they go a long way. I don't know if you wanted a better answer than that, but. I think maybe that. I'm, I'm trying to think of, yeah. I think one of the big things that we really picked up, which is I think a little unique to our situation, was just like how we went about living in this bus together. I think there was a lot of I would, I'm going to say like day seven out of what was ended up being a 42-day road trip that was the film. Day seven was probably the low point. I think we can all pretty much agree on that. We're like days one through six, we were like, oh, we're on the road. This is going to be great. We're having so much fun. Like, yeah, we're going to make it. And by day seven, we're like, oh, shit. Like, we day really seven was also like 107 degrees in, in St. St. Louis. <laughs> I'm not a fan of St. And Louis And we're right only now. in St. Louis. Yeah. <laughs> and then at that point, we're like, oh, we've got another... 35 days or whatever left like we're not yeah. there's no getting around this so I think at that point we really sat down and, and figured out a better plan of like okay when we're on the road driving for six hours like where can we put Zach's chair so it's in both a good spot for him and a good spot for us so it's not in anybody's way and I think that just like being really open and being able to have those conversations really bluntly I think was was one of the biggest things we picked up a really good way to also get to that point where you're able to see things a little bit differently is to choose a week in like the fall or the spring or in like late winter or it's gonna be like really snowy or really rainy and spend the whole entire week trying to be in a wheelchair so that you can see Don't what it's do like. that, that's craziness. <laughs> and only this guy would do it. All right, spend a day, spend a day in a wheelchair um, so that you can actually see that there is no curb cut. So that you can actually see that a door isn't wide enough for that, you know, the power um, button to actually open the door isn't placed in the right position. So really you can't do anything about it. Um, and it'll shape the way you look at the world around you so that you can um, better interact with your patients. 
I think just to get to a point where it's so, it becomes so seamless, mm -hmm. especially with the interactions and the people that you meet, where it's not like, oh, I'm going to meet the disabled people. You know, I'm going <laughs> to do this. It's like, oh, this is just something I'm going to do. This is my activity. It's going to be fun. You know, and so I think at some point, you know, it just starts, like half the things, you know, that I'm doing, I don't even think about, you know, and the people that I'm meeting and doing things, like you said, you just kind of end up, end up kind of living your life, you know, with, peop with and without people with disabilities, you know, and then it just becomes part of, it's just normal. And I think part of it is how do you get to that point? You know, what types of experiences of just immersing yourself, of, of trying to take away the stigma, just take, just make it normal. And um, I think that's part of what we're all trying to do in our lives is just try to really, you know, be valued for who we are and those differences, but also become kind of seamless in our interactions where we're just like, this is someone we're hanging out with, it's really cool. It's not like this weird, like disabled time, you know, it's, this is just my life. And so I think if we can get to that point, then we kind of, kind of clicked in. If you take away like one thing from tonight, put a big gold star next to that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, this will be our last question. It's kind of funny timing for our last question, but I've been thinking a lot about equity and access, and we know transportation is the number one barrier and information is a huge barrier as well, but you just hit on this, Zach, about how expensive it is to participate. And so I'm wondering, in your travels, you know, we really are wrestling with this in Boston, but in your travels, have you come across any solutions to that? Um, I mean, there are the foundations that will fund somebody's chair, but that's there are 744,000 people with disabilities in Massachusetts. So these little foundations are doing a piece of it, but do you Some know of any cost. more sustainable options for making sure that be, you know, the UN says this is a right for every human being? How do we make that more possible for everybody? Some groups working on low cost. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, think, I think it's a matter of these you know, communities and these adaptive programs kind of consulting with rec programs. I know in New York City they do a lot of, um, you know, they, they might, the rec departments might have a, a hand cycle bike at, at a park, or I know at, at a state park in Rhode Island we have a hand cycle bike, but I think it's kind of just like educating the people that are in par um, that are in powers at these rec departments and at the state departments and letting them know like, hey, this is, it's really expensive for, for everybody to own a hand cycle, but if a park can have one, and how, many, how many people are gonna show up in one day wanting to use that? I mean, maybe there'll be days where there'll be multiple people, but generally speaking, it'll be available to somebody with a disability that's going with their family to a park to use something like that. Um, and, and I think Challenge Athletes Foundation, I'm not sure if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that, they're huge in, in supplying money to you know, anybody that has a specific piece of equipment that they want. And I think just, um, you know, we have the advantage of, of social media these days, being able to connect with people in your area. I would share any of my equipment with anybody um, if it means that they can get out and do something. I'm not gonna use it all the time. And I think that, you know, we, we learn in kindergarten that you should be able to share your stuff. And I think, you know, it's really important, you know, especially with people with disabilities. Like, you have something in common and, and you have sympathy for these people because you've been through what they're going through. Get online, um, get, you know, connected with the people in your community and share the equipment. I know that doesn't solve the problem of everybody having their own equipment, but it's huge. I mean, it's very expensive. I don't know if anybody's ever, you know, unless you're very wealthy, you, not every one person is not going to own all of these pieces of equipment, and I think programs are really important to keep you know emerging programs. And um, there's a couple groups out there that are looking at low cost, especially like internationally. Like a Motivation International mm -hmm. has developed this initiative for low cost chairs and sports equipment. Um, they've gotten it down to like three hundred dollars, and but it's pretty basic. I mean, it's actually quite it's decent. But it's, um, you know, thinking about shipping it in because a lot of it's produced in different parts. Um, but I do think that one of the things that, I, you know, some of us have talked about internationally has been the fact that with the more, more participation by more people, whether you have a disability or not, is actually going to end up driving the cost down. Because if you, if you have actually more people participating in some of these different sports, whether it's, you know, wheelchair basketball or sled hockey or you know, some of the other, you know, blind soccer or, you know, any of the different activities that if those become more available to anybody so that you can just go to your, you know, local sports store and, you know, you get your lacrosse stick, you get your hockey stick, you get your wheelchair, you know, that that's the kind of time where then the cost is driven down where people are just using these as it becomes just another piece of sports equipment. I mean, I think over time, 
that becomes possible where the sports become not just disabled sports, but they become just sports. Yeah. Um, obviously, we want to make sure people with disabilities, that's who we're serving, but that ultimately these can be sports that anybody can participate. And I think that will actually help tr continue to drive the cost down. But um, that is one of the biggest challenges, I would say, you know, the equipment and the transportation, you know, to just be creative in our local communities, you know, which is what I think a lot of us here are working toward. But, um, but no, you hit on the head with like some of the challenges. I just wanted to say that I wanted to answer that question that way and that like mm. one way we can participate is by just using market forces and increasing mm. demand. But Eli did way better than I ever could. <laughs> <laughs> which leads me to a, a thing that I really want to end on which is that Zach was the first subject of the film. We, had, we went out and shot frames of him surfing. The next frames of the film were actually of Eli. So the interview that you saw about, a, about an hour into the film um, with Victor and Angela, Eli's actually in there too, very briefly. The reason that interview looks so bad, like one <laughs> camera is like hot pink and the other one's blue, it's just like the angles are strange. It's because we, we didn't know what we were doing. We had just, we just picked up a second camera and we were just figuring it out. And, and someone was like, look, if you're gonna do this, you gotta go talk to Eli. So we came up to Boston, he actually is, um, he, he works at, uh, partly at the uh, Institute for Human Centered Design, which is just a few blocks away from here. Um, so Eli was a huge inspiration. He has been with us since the beginning. Um, I think all of you should take out your phones right now and follow on Twitter and like <laughs> on Facebook, the Inclusive Sports Initiative. Um, and uh, and that, that will be your, your number one source for the forefront of this revolution. That is Eli's voice. So thank you, Eli. And thank you all for coming. Uh, awesome. So I actually have one final question for the group. When can we expect a sequel? Yeah. <laughs> We've been talking about eligibility too. Like ten no. years later, they do like a road trip through Canada in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're talking it's, about it. The fact of the matter is, we wouldn't make it back from eligibility <laughs> too. Great. Well, thank you to these gentlemen again for being here tonight. There's no coming back. And to everyone at the Real Abilities Film Festival. On your way out, please make sure to sign up for our mailing list. It's the best way to stay up to date on adult programming here at the museum. We hope you had an inspiring evening, and thank you for being here.